So we left it at me getting to decide what the theme was. And then Kim came up with a nice theme. So we're kind of combining two ideas. My theme of the week has been float the head. So I'm sorry, my theme for next week is float the head. So we were going to talk a little bit about that. But Kim had a great question about how you get your abs to fire well, strongly, and feel it if you're not lifting your head, right? Mm -hmm. So that is, that actually, while it maybe seems a little bit opposite to floating the head, is actually similar in a lot of ways because it's the same abdominal contraction that allows us to stabilize with or without the head up. And then if we have that good stability, then lifting the head does not become such an issue. Right. It makes that lifting the head a lot easier. Sure. So maybe, um, maybe we'll start with just um, the basic idea of how do you get the abs on when you're not lifting the head in a way that feels like it's active. And I have to say that I think it's harder to, so actually more advanced to get the abs on, to understand how to turn them on when you're not lifting the head than if you were just to crank up into that upper abdominal curl. So, um, but there are a couple things we can do to try and, and really activate and teach people how to do that well. So our, our first one and the one that you all know very well is the breathing in neutral spine, predicting the load uh, and the fives with the head down. So, but the way that you would cue that, and, and this is, comes back to something I think I shared with you a few weeks ago about the idea of dropping the belly to extend the legs. So let's, let's go through a few of those and see if I can get you to feel something and then we can talk about it. But so if you want to do it or watch it, it's totally up to you. But here, if, if I start with just a, taking a second to drop down into my very cold mat. <laughs> so taking a breath in here and then exhaling, letting my belly sink downward, right? That's the, without changing the neutral spine. So belly sinks down, tightening the muscles in here, just the right amount, right? Not more than I need. And then releasing and then exhaling, dropping the belly down and tightening there, just so that it feels like my muscles are on, but they're not at their strongest point, right? That's where we want them here for now. And then interesting that we're talking about this because I recently had a client, which I haven't seen in quite a while, who just could not figure out, they wanted to push the belly out to tighten. But if I told them to pull the belly in, the ribs lifted up. If I told them to take the ribs down, the belly squished out. So it was kind of this, <laughs> how do I get them here? And we started again from scratch with feeling the breath, right? So that's always a good place to go back to is hands on the belly, feel the breath into the belly. And then exhale, feel the belly fall down as you exhale, just what it would do naturally. And at the end of that, tightening a little bit. And then just making sure that the ribs aren't flaring upward. So then just letting the tips of the ribs connect downward a little bit. Right. So that would be where I would spend a little bit of time with somebody first, because I think understanding that well will help progress them well. So then holding here, keeping those muscles on and maybe even touching them to bring one leg up, holding there again, belly in then bring the other leg up, trying not to allow any shifting while that's happening. And we can move to that predict the load. Now, predict the load in general is a place where a lot of people go wrong. And we've talked about this lots of times because it's such a small motion for most people to be able to stabilize and come back without it getting to the lower back in the neutral spine position. So very hard, very hard exercise when done properly. So what I went to in order to get the ab contraction on was the hands behind the knees. So this idea of pressing, so exhaling first still, exhaling first, belly sinking down, legs pressing away, inhaling back. 
exhaling, belly pressing away, then belly dropping down, then legs pressing away. And then I feel like I'm really working in this deep abdominal region and that my belly has found its scoop and then back in, right? So exhaling, belly sinks first, start that exhale, then press into the hands. And even if I end up curling the tail a little bit as I'm pressing away, that's okay. I'm not lifting the tail, I'm just pressing, scooping the belly, but then I start to really feel like I'm working down here. And then that can progress to that feeling of belly down, legs up, or I think I gave you guys that image of the blow up, you know, those blow up little people. If you push on, put your foot on their stomach, their legs and arms are gonna shoot upward and then down. And then I feel like I'm really working in here and I feel that my muscles are very solid and that frees my legs in order to allow that motion to happen. So belly sinking, legs are reaching and then inhaling belly sinking and reaching and bend exhale belly sinks legs up and bend bellies dropping legs lifting and bend right so for me i now have all of this work happening in here and then i can release it relaxing down so I don't know if, and then, I mean, you could definitely take this on onward, right? So that feeling, and then we can take that into any of the double leg stretch, right? Single leg stretch, head down, keeping that connection and really finishing these motions is, is a good challenge here in this lower part. Right. And then even single straight leg stretch with a head down, I think is, much harder than with the head up. Um, so those, those I would do just like that, head down. The crisscross is a little more complex, and that's where, so the difference is that when the head is down, the upper part of the obliques doesn't work, they don't work as intensely. So you're not feeling the burn in the upper abs, that, but you should be feeling a good burn in that lower abdominal region. So for this upper region, what I usually have them do is take the hand behind, one hand behind the neck, one hand across the body, and I have them try and connect. So this open rib going towards that hip in the opposite direction, so closing it and reaching across and down. And I usually stay on the one side because that helps me really find that connection across. And then I can do the same thing if I want with one opposite leg extending and extending and exhaling. Right, exhale. Right, and one more time. And then switching sides. So going across all without lifting, just sort of allowing a little bit of that diagonal work to happen and finishing that leg extension, right? Finishing the leg motion really helps me challenge my center. Good. And then back down. So that's how I would work the fives. And I finished that little set we did and I feel like I did something. So I don't know if that helps. Um, yeah, then the other way to, so then how, if you're not going to roll somebody's head up, how do you get them to feel the upper abs? That's, that be, starts to become the question. And we, we've talked in the past about supporting with a ball behind the head, yeah. which is one way. And that, if that's an okay place for them to be, you can use that without having them lift from there. So supported in a little bit of flexion, whether it's on a wedge or on a ball, sometimes that will help them activate more. It actually might help them stabilize a little bit more. Stabilize. Yeah. Or a, pillow. or a pillow, something behind the neck, a little bit that supports it, supports them. So if that's appropriate for this, for the client, you could definitely use that. And then you don't lift the head from that place. You just cheat them in there. This is actually why I like to have the headrest up on the reformer 
when you're doing work on the reformer because it does help activate and helps them draw the ribs in. So it's actually helping the obliques turn on a little bit more. So that's why I usually actually don't prefer head headrest flat on the reformer. And then the other ways to really get that um, activation is on all fours. So all, all fours progressing to planking. That's how you can really get the, the upper abs working. And that's a lot of work. And it's so much work that I think it's challenging for people. Mm -hmm. So they don't really get it because it's that challenging. So keep in mind that these, these exercises are harder. So if we want it, I mean, I think the most basic, you can do any of these here and you won't see through my big sweatshirt. But... Um, any of these that kind of ask for a press into the floor with the shoulders and then a rib cage lift up and inhale, right? And then exhaling, press into the floor, rib cage lifts up and release. And that is, that is your upper ab curl, right? So, but it's an unloaded upper ab curl, so might be fine. The only people that may be contraindicated are people who are supposed to be holding static, which would be people who have an active fracture. Yeah, you wouldn't be doing that. And then doing something like this one, which I find is super challenging, the leg out, one leg up, keeping square, and then tucking in and reaching out. And that tucking in being the rib cage lifts to get the knee in and reach it away, right? Lift that rib cage and reach it away and lift and reach it away and then switching sides try the other one right? i usually start with the leg out just to square my pelvis then float up make sure i'm staying level and then lift and reach and lift get that rib cage up out of the way and really lift and reach and lift and reach yeah, so now I feel like I got my upper abs working. So I think that is, those are the exercises that come to mind for me to get the abs on for people who are having a hard time uh, understanding it. You might even want to wedge the, wedge the hips. That's what I was doing. I've seen this too, is just to help put the, the hands just under your hips. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A little bit more for the knee for the back. Yeah. Makes it easier, like the wedge. But yeah. I've been doing that a little bit, and then, or offering that as an alternative in the um, bone strengthening class. Yeah. Yeah. I think having anything under the hips is going to help them. What it does is it takes them out of neutral, though. So just being aware that that's what you're that's what you're then doing. But I think sometimes getting them into that slight posterior tilt is just more protective. It depends on what you're trying to do, right? If it's an advanced person, you wouldn't do that because you want them to work for the neutral and they should know how much to move their legs. But a, a more beginner person that you're just trying to get through and a group class setting, then you really want to keep them safe. Uh, and they will get strengthening out of being, even if they're in that posterior tilt, but you don't have to be so worried about how much every little movement that they make. So that, that is a good option. So wedging or hands under anything, a towel roll under the hips, any of that works to give them a little more support. So, and now here's something I've seen um, shared bats do, a, a kind of a, a modified teaser. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's safe to do? Yeah, I mean, it, it should be if they can keep their backs in neutral. And that's hard. That's hard for me. Right, so <laughs> keeping the back in neutral in this position, right? I, I'm hopefully well practiced so I can do it, but I don't trust that a lot of my clients can do it. And my, my hip quads start Quads and hip flexors kick in right away. Hi. Hi, yes. Congrats. Now I did do a little um, exercise the other day with the hands behind really pressed in and then we were doing a uh, quad contraction here. I felt like that, that might be a good place to start. Mm -hmm so that they can really work for that neutral spine and not have so much pressure of having the uh, whole body weight on this. 
this is easier. Yeah. yeah. This variation is easier on the elbows. Yeah. But still, it's easy to dump into my low back, and then I'm a bit loaded. <laughs> yeah. So keeping neutral, keeping lifted. Yeah. This this could work too. And this is less. This way, there's no pressure on the neck. So it really depends on um, if you're what kind of person you're working with. So if it's somebody who has osteoporosis, you're not that worried if they load their discs a little bit. What you're worried about is loading the vertebra. So he, in this position, my back is not really loaded, right? The pressure, there's pressure on my sacrum and pelvis, yeah. but then there's no pressure on my spine. So for neck and um, upper back, I'm not really loading them. So I could work here and do these exercises. And I think that's probably what she was doing. Yeah. Where is here, if you, and again, if you stay neutral here, you're um, in your back safe. But if you start to roll into that load, you're getting a bit of a load. Um, it's not as much as a full teaser or anything, but so it's only for somebody who's quite sensitive with a loaded flexion, would I be worried? And osteoporosis does not indicate loaded flexion for the discs which is why it's quite safe if osteoporosis is the only issue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, great, great questions. And how do I turn off my quads? You don't. <laughs> well, you, your legs, your hip flexors, it's really your hip flexors more than your quads and maybe rectus femoris, but it's, it's dropping that belly in, holding more through the belly. But your legs are heavy things, so somebody's got to hold them up. So it would be, <laughs> I, I know, you need that external, external muscles helping you there, right? Yeah, that's probably why you're also more, more on, yes, always stretch after you ride or run, <laughs> it says me, who, we won't look at my track record either. Uh, right, so um, hopefully that's helpful. Yeah. yeah it's hard. It's just hard. The other one that I think is probably safe is taking the ball behind the shoulder blades. I think that that's oh, really, really. Um, doing. Yeah. Uh, on yes, on the ball, and then just little mini contractions there that that could be an option too yeah a quite inflated ball so not a not a totally deflated one right just so it props um so yeah there's that and then right so then if we take that idea into the float the head idea i've i've been through so i keep circling through different themes and about six weeks ago i did a whole head posture th theme and so but now I'm back to float the head again because no matter how many times I feel like I teach it I still don't get what I want out of everybody I think it's someplace that it's just hard to get it right and then people just need to be reminded a lot about what what it means but my pet peeve is that people upper ab crow and they just pull on their neck all the time and so I and we've talked about this as a group before about the chest lift versus the head lift and that it's really the rib cage that does that work if we're talking about supine upper ab so i have for a long time now actually taught people to interlace the fingers behind the neck press into the neck and pull up on the neck to lengthen so using the pinky sides to really pull up and lengthen the neck so if i were to interlace my fingers behind my neck and dig my pinkies into the occiput, squeeze inward and lengthen. I can lengthen my neck and drop my shoulders. That's my ideal place for my head and neck. Now I feel like I, if I move my trunk, my head just stays with my hands, which come along with my trunk and then back. So I can really um, just keep my head with my hands no matter what I do, even if I were to go 
into a little bit more extension, I can still keep my head with my hands and my neck doesn't play a role. So then if I take that posture down to the mat, it's the same thing, squeezing in, pinkies digging in to the back of the skull, tailbone down, stretching the neck. And then instead of thinking of lifting the head, squeeze the ribs and they work as the ribs work, my chest comes up, and because my shoulders are touched, my head is still heavy in my hands here. Right? And then I can keep working that rib cage to come up more, but keep the head in the hands, the shoulders down. And that's the idea of float the head and reverse. So that's float the head with support right up there. And then back down. So this, again, would be contraindicated for osteoporosis or somebody with a disc, cervical disc issue or maybe a thoracic issue, right? But otherwise, that's how we float is the head floats because the ribs come together and then back down, right? So that, that is the idea if we're supine. The other way that I can get a head float is for me, I can get it from holding on back here. And I've, since I last worked on this topic of neck posture, I've been playing with a lot of these ideas with some clients and, and some of them cannot, absolutely cannot get it this way. They constantly stress in their neck, but here that same idea of predict the load with my elbows at a bit of an angle out, I exhale, press the legs. And as I press the legs, my trunk comes along with, so my, Head and shoulders are actually relaxed, and I don't feel any tension. So keep pulling those shoulders down the back body. Right? Elbows can even drop down a little towards the floor if that helps to wrap and get length in the neck. And then I can move the legs. So I brought the legs in towards the chest. Now I'll press the legs away. Shoulders down, neck is long. So that I'm not actually ever thinking about lifting my head. I'm thinking about moving my legs and keeping a connection in my abs. So just, just wrapping those shoulders down as I go, my head has to come along for that ride. And then when I get here, it's vertical enough that I really don't feel any tension in the neck. So you could do that with this sort of bent leg idea, or you could do it wrapping and going into the straight legs up idea, which I think is actually even better. It really gives me this nice place. I really feel like I could be here for a very long time. And then back down. Yeah, so there's, uh, those are great, I think great ways if they have that lat connection already. If there's no lat connection, you're not going to get that uh, feeling. Yeah, and I think that's where people go wrong is they end up here. And now I'm stressing everything. Instead of wrapping and lengthening, now I'm stressing nothing. It's a very subtle, but a very big difference. So then wrap the shoulders down around your back more. Yeah. And then grow the back of the neck. Yeah, that's it. That looks great. And then, yeah, so you could stay with that yeah. for a long time because it's not, you're not using these small neck flexors to try and get up, your, or to try and pick up the head. Um, we also, I think, went over that little exercise where you could lay down and hold your head in its position, and I should turn around, and essentially slide your head off the mat. So I'll get my head neutral, slide it off, and, and hold it there. That really works those neck flexors and stretches those back, back neck muscles, the short capodi muscles, those extensors. So this is a really nice exercise for strengthening the front of the neck. And then I just slide back into place. So I'm not lifting the head. That's the key is not to lift the head in that exercise, but to keep it in place, just holding there. And then as the, the support goes away, just keep the head there would give me really nice, strong neck flexors. It's, really hard. it's very hard. Yeah, I, I don't recommend doing that for too long when you first start doing it. 
just just a few seconds at a time and then building up to more because it is really challenging and it really works here and if there's any tightness in the back here you're really pulling on that tightness which is great but also challenging i think um so that's another great way to just get some activation. But then notice that we did that neutral for support, not trying to lift the chin to the chest and roll the head up. That's just where people start cranking on their head. Not, not a good thing. But I ha like I said, I haven't been super successful with having people do the wrapping shoulders and getting the head right. So if you guys have any input on what your experience is with that, with clients, I've tried it here. I've tried it with a band around the legs, uh, around the thighs and doing it that way, just to bring the hands a little lower. And I've tried it with the band at the feet, also trying to get a little more pull. Uh, some of my clients, it, it seems like I don't get anywhere ever with that particular thing, with that head position and with activating the rib cage. So I don't know if you have similar experiences or Yes, with the upper ab curl, trying to explain that yeah. is so hard. Mm -hmm. And I haven't been very successful with there hardly anybody. Yeah. I, especially virtually. It's really hard virtually. Yeah. So maybe using the propping, that's more what I've been doing is using the ball between the shoulder blades or the roller even behind the shoulder blades. And even using our, you know, fabulous thoracic rolling that everybody loves doing, but using that as an active exercise. So if I, you know, people get really comfortable with the rolling their spine, you know, they think, oh, it still feels so good. It just feels so good. But then really taking that into this practice of learning how to uh, upper ab curl. So hands, I'm interlacing. I'm putting my pinkies at the base of the skull, squeezing the neck inward, and then letting my hips float just a very little bit, and then press the legs and allow my tummy to curl, and everything curls in line. And then my head, though, stays with my hands long, and I'm getting a little curl here, and then I can release back to neutral, and then curling here, and back to neutral. So this this one, at least I feel like they're being forced into the right kind of curved position. You can't do that with somebody who has osteoporosis. That's way too much pressure on thoracic spine, but, um, but it is something for pe other people who you might be able to get into if we're just talking about getting the right head posture over. Yeah, and that's Kim's got herself on the ball there which I think is really cu quite comfy and a, and a nice place to just work on finding that. Does it give you a little more connection in the rib cage there? Yeah. 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 Feels, nice. Feels nice. Yeah. So that might be another really good way to get um, them in the right, to kind of prop them there and then work from there. And I've also found that people who are, who do stress in that upper, that it's actually, I, I'm finding that it's more beneficial to get them up and then do a little up from here and down rather than all the way down and all the way up. I find holding here and coming up a little more down, up, down, up, and even for the diagonals down, up, but not the whole range, keeps them engaged longer. They don't go on vacation every time and then they don't throw their body. I can... This is all momentum now that I can just throw my body there. I'm not working. I'm working probably 40%, not really. But if I have to stay here, I really have to work for this and support and work and support and work. I'm trying to go as fast as some of my clients trying to do this. I know. <laughs> I try and tell them that if you go faster, it doesn't mean we finish sooner. So yeah. we still have the same amount of yeah. time to get through. <laughs> So faster doesn't make it go by quicker. <laughs> uh, so then the other float the head, the other things that, that come to mind for float the head for me are all the quadruped work and prone, quadruped prone. So um, in quadruped, it's really the posture of the head and neck. And this idea 
of pushing the floor away with the shoulders enough that the neck grows long. So versus that, pushing the floor away, growing the back of the neck long. This is a float the head for me here. And then you could work through, through again, through the rib cage if you wanted, and then back. Or you could just work with holding that and then changing what's happening in the lower half, keeping the back of the neck long. And, you know, you could even move into two feet doing, you could advance that quite a ways by having them roll their knees on the roller. Like uh, things can get really advanced here if we wanted to, to really work here, you know, all with that same float the head. So we could even work on, I did this with them, which was mean, a uh, single leg rolling in and out. Like, um, you know, it's nice. It's a fun exercise if they're getting it, right? Like a FTD florist type thing uh, on the roller. So those are the like more advanced ways to keep that float head posture. And then plus, if you were in a not a back safe environment, doing the teasers and all of that, that is actually really great work for connecting up through the head, neck, shoulders trunk because if I start working through this is basically the where I stole this from is the teaser idea right this is that modified back safe version with the upper ab curl but you could work into our full teaser right holding and working your way down trying to control that head neck right reaching up and going down Right, so that, that is, um, and actually one of my favorites here for talking not back safe is the neck pull exercise. I really do like this one, this, this one. Where, well, this is the one where you're right, really stretching and the back of the pinkies are pulling the head up off your shoulders and you hinge back as far as you can go. And then when you can't, you hollow and round. Right? And then as you're coming up, Exhaling, coming up, hollowing, right? Finding that round and then opening, stretching again and hinging. So it's just a nice way to work through that, the different postures for the head and neck. Right, and stacking. Yeah, so that's, that is, and my neck doesn't feel like it's straining at all with those, which is what's so nice about all of them. And then prone, the things that come automatically to mind are the neck reaching long and the hovering head and neck. Right, so this I've come into a lot of, a lot of different ways. One of my favorites is the shoulder blade shrug kind of sphinx pose, which I like to call sphinx pose which is somewhere between our elbows and flat down, right? But it just gives that feeling. I still feel like I'm pulling forward, but as I pull forward, I can imagine that the back of the neck is pulling long, shoulders down my back. And then I can do legs floating. I can just hold here, keep pulling, rolling down, stretching out and going up and down from here, right? I can come in and I can actually do my single leg kicks and things from here if I wanted to, or you know any of these glute series. So you know, just that's one position. The other is working on floating the head, shoulders down with the arms lifting up in our W position, or hands at the A position, stretching long back, wrapping the shoulders, floating the head that way, and back down. And I, I've been teaching it with the arms reaching long and then palms turning and then back down. And that seems to really help them find and float. And those are excellent for osteoporosis because they're extension based, yeah. So all of those, all that on fours, all the prone work is super, super excellent for that. Yeah, and the Sphinx is really great for it. I don't know if you guys like that Sphinx pose. It kind of, yeah, and that feeling of just pulling. I, I like it. It feels like I get a lot of traction. 
Yeah, you know, I've started to like it a lot more. I feel like I can engage the shoulder blades more. Yeah. There. This is a gentler. gentler. And then you could work on opening the breastbone more, letting that part come down and forward as you pull with the arms. Yeah, there you go. In the back of the neck, really stretching. So a lot going on. there's a lot going on <laughs> for a little non-movement almost, yeah. you know, like there's a lot happening there. But those are sort of my float the head ideas. So I'll be incorporating a lot of those into class next week and depending on which class it is. So with that uh, more advanced class or the, the super strong where I don't have to worry about back safe, we'll work on neck pull and teasers and stuff like that. For, for the other classes, we'll stay in the back safe zone and I'll start them head down, trying to feel the abs and then work up to um, hands behind the thighs or feet on a TheraBand, pushing the legs away, connecting the lats. Uh, we did a lot of that on Tuesday this week because I was talking about dummy muscles and the upper traps being dummy. So I'm trying to build on <laughs> what I teach each week. Now we've talked about how we don't want this posture, how we want this posture. Now maybe with this posture, we can float the head. So that's kind of what I'm going to start with on Tuesday and then build on that and make it more advanced. And typically by Thursday night, it's more of a stretch. That, so Tuesday night is still more strength and stretch. Thursday night is really just more, more focused on stretch. Usually by the end of the week, I figure people need a really good stretching out. So, um, so that's where I'm, I usually go with it. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Any other comments or questions? There was one more thing I was, oh, I know what I was going to add. Just a reminder. So of the anatomy again, because I think we get stuck in that obliques are up here and then transverse is down here. And I really wanted to clarify that that's actually not true. It really is obliques the whole way, transverse abdominis the whole way. But down up here, transverse abdominis, I think has less of a role, I would say. I don't know, you know, I have never done like an EMG study to see exactly. But I would think that up here it gets more help because of the rib cage, the intercostals and the obliques here. Down here, it's gut, right? There's no bony structure that comes around the front. So it's just transverse abdominis and the fascia. And then the obliques are here also, but they end in fascia. Uh, so, but they are obliques all the way down here. So even if you're not feeling up here in the rib cage all the time working, down, feeling down here is obliques as well. So maybe, I don't know if that helps, just as a reminder of that we've got this wrapping and we've got these diagonals, but they do go the whole way. So if you're working down here, you are actually working those obliques too. You don't necessarily have to feel it up here. It, it won't, it will strengthen you more in the head up position to be able to bring your head up. That's just specificity of training, right? And recruiting uh, fibers of the muscles that that lead to that specificity of training but just because you're not feeling that burn up in here doesn't mean they're not working here's one i've been doing to get and it seems to work right here and that sometimes i do it on the roller the hips on the roller bring one leg out it's easy and then exhale pulling in and i can pull in from that right lower quadrant that's where i feel it yeah yeah, you can definitely do that. And anything with a little rotation. So if you took both knees to one side slightly, yeah. right, that's, that's the same idea. Both knees keeping anchored, pulling back, but pulling back, not with the legs. I can do that without any work, but pulling back with those muscles and pulling back. So that, that is good. The other one that I think is super effective is actually the short, the short box series on the reformer, right? Uh, old man at a gym, twist with a stick. But remember in the beginning I said those are more advanced, I think. They're beginner exercises. But if a beginner does them, they don't necessarily engage properly. It's advanced, I think, to be able to engage across the body with those abs and have them 
drive that rotation. But that, I think, is actually safe and, and osteoporosis safe because you're not going to end range rotation if those muscles are firing and you're not jamming yourself into rotation. You're just actively moving into that rotation and inhaling back and then rotating and inhaling back. And uh, you could use that definitely on the mat, either with the dowel or have them hold a ball or the ring. ring or the ball. I like the ring because it presses the ribs. So it brings some awareness or, or holding on to the ball works too. Rotation. Mm -hmm. It won't, that won't let them go as far if they have something in front that they're holding on to. So here I can put that at my rib cage, bring it up underneath my stuff. <laughs> and then pressing, like pressing just gently, but then I can really engage this rib cage, this rib cage and come around. And I don't end up going that far because I can't, uh, I can't go past it. My arms won't go without my trunk this way. Whereas a lot of times the arms just go and the trunk doesn't really go. And I just get the swinging. But yeah, or out here, that does it too. Right, that really helps limit, which is what we want because there isn't that much rotation in the thoracic spine, is there? <laughs> There's not a lot of rotation anywhere in the spine, honestly, but except for cervical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Any thoughts, questions, anything? Um, what about like a, like if you were to go from plank to like side plank and kind of that transition, does that kind of get those? And then, yeah. Yes. I feel like that, that gets the, that rib and the upper ab also, right? And Definitely the, does. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely does. And even if you did it as just a marching exercise, you know, coming up and down and up and down, right up and down. That's a great exercise for that. Yes. And anything in side bend or side plank, I mean, is really, um, uh, it's hard. You do it from kneeling. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anything that goes uh, into side plank or side bend is also working those same muscles. So you could potentially do also, you know, even just a kneeling here and just side over and back and over and back and over right so that's working actually both sides mm -hmm. yeah both sides opposite so that's great yeah and then we have our lovely side sit-ups but you can't if you can't sit up even working um sometimes working if you have support where you don't have to drop the knees all the way, I would say it's safe for everyone. Um, but it's not really, full rotation isn't that safe. But this is back to our sort of knees falling, coming up, knees falling, pulling up, right, knees falling, pulling up. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I like it. Um, Nothing else? <laughs> well, I was just thinking, putting Kim's question together with the side plank, how do you make your head float in side plank? Yes, you do. <laughs> just make it happen. <laughs> yeah. So uh, similar to the one that I've been working on is this one. Well, anything inside, so even just practicing here with the right ahead posture, even supported if you wanted, would be fine. Um, or more challenging is working on either in kind of this mermaid 
is probably the easiest way to do it. Um, he, mermaid sort of hinging down. So I'm not dropping, I'm staying up, connected, and going over and then back, right? Over, so I'm, I'm, I'm just hinging, sort of planked side body, and you can see that hips lifting up. I'm not concerned about that because I'm working this now. That's one way to work it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, always, I always tend to get people who complain about doing side plank and their neck getting. Yeah. They're not getting tweaky, yeah. yeah. I think um, working on, even working on these, pulling the shoulder down and just putting the head in that position, even if you have to support it at first and have them hold on to the head and neck and press, I press the head back into my hand a little bit mm -hmm. and open that elbow and then I get the length of the neck. So keep pressing a little bit back into the hand and that gives me that length in the neck so I can start strengthening there. There was one other thing. Oh, the thing that I really like for this is not easy to do on a mat. Uh, it's really hovering inside. So like over the big barrel with the trunk just a little bit off or you can even use it off the edge of a Cadillac, for example just with that, this part of you off of the edge and so start supported, but then take the hands away and support again. And the head would just be in neutral. So it'd be like side lying, except that I could, I mean, I guess you could practice it like this, but just with the, uh, this part of me off an edge, and then I could use the hands to support the neck and then take the hands away and support and hands away. So this does actually do some work. And yeah, I, Genevieve, you put yourself on the ball. I think that was actually smart. You could actually put yourself on a little ball right here. Let's see Kim do it too. And squash the ball so it holds you. And then neck long behind, yeah. So that's a little side bent. You were actually a little better before, I think. Yeah, there. And then you could start with support and then take the arms away. But just learning to, to have the neck in that neutral mm -hmm. by an isometric, in an isometric way might yeah. be the way to start. Okay, yeah, I've actually been using the ball to like get people to start doing side roll up a little bit. Oh yeah, uh, great. But I hadn't thought about the isometric hold for the neck. So that's good. Cause yeah, I'll have them come up and then like hold here and then you know, because people have such such trouble with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, the isometric hold. I like the side roll up there too. Oh, I might need to borrow that from you. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. People hate it when I give it give that one, but. <laughs> <laughs> but, they, but they like it too because they know it. They need it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I do like it, yeah. That's hard. It's not, it's hard, yeah. yeah. It's hard, I like it. <laughs> I know, but well, then you should do my FTD florist on the roller. Right. It's yeah, fun. That one next. <laughs> it's fun, I like that one. I like anything where my hips get to go up over my head, you know. <laughs> but it's, it's a bit, well, So it's this first, right? With your knees up. Yeah, okay. it's just in and out with the knees up first. Yeah, and then you can just take one leg, keep one leg out, bring the other in. Yep, now just switch, bend that other knee, and you'll you. bend the rolling the roller leg in. <laughs> okay, something to work on. Yeah, it is. It's a good something to work on. Yeah? Yeah. All right, so I will um, let you know what my themes are for the next few weeks. And if you're interested, we can do kind of a, a week ahead on those themes. Or any other questions, I'm happy to direct 
the time towards those. So, so awesome. Good. All right. Cool. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for hanging awesome. in there. Next time we expect some input. Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, All right. guys. All right. Bye. See you later. Bye. Bye. Okay, it's me teaching next, so I don't have to wipe off. Oh. <laughs> That's right, it's your day. It's yeah, but Genevieve's taking my 3.30 so that oh. I can see Dave because his hand flared up again. Tia, Tia wants to book a Zoom with you mm -hmm. to have her a bike fit. I can't do a bike fit on Zoom. I need to measure. Okay. Yeah. She is going to set up her bike it's inside on a trainer. Okay. Yeah, I really need to do measurements and stuff. I could look at it, but I, I don't think I'd be very helpful. Okay, I'll just say it doesn't.